Can I borrow a prayer book? <laughs> I've been saying the same. I've been saying the same prayer for 12 years, and I still don't have it down. Should I ring the bell? <laughs> Quiet, everyone. Very good. You can watch me turn pages. I know it's because I've had what I call opposition to this beginning today, but it's going to begin. All right, we begin today a new course, which we're start, uh, beginning just for the season of Lent. It should be about four sessions long, Lord willing, and it is entitled The Eight Thoughts. If you've been around me long enough, you know what the eight thoughts are. If you've never heard of this before, great, because it's all going to be brand new to you. Um, but we will cover this uh, by introduction today. I won't uh, spoil it for you. But it is a, certainly a penitential theme. It is uh, the eight thoughts are essentially precursors to the seven deadly sins. And so as we consider these things, we actually are going to work on an ancient strategy for victory over sin and especially over temptation, actually. Over sin, of course, but over temptation. Is, uh, is the focus of the eight thoughts. Before we begin, we shall pray. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who has committed to thy holy church the care and nurture of thy people, and with thy wisdom those who teach and those who learn, that rejoicing in the knowledge of thy truth, they may worship thee and serve thee from generation to generation, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. All right, this is going to be a little bit different from our uh, usual pattern of Sunday school courses in which we're very heavy on uh, slides and information that, that's presented on the screen as I uh, give this to you and as we uh, discuss. This time I'll be sending out, and this is, was sent out last week, it's posted on the website, in a sense, chapter by chapter, uh, the material that we're going to be Covering. So if you received the email and, uh, or from the Shield and clicked on it and read the article for today, this is the eight thoughts, Evagrius of Pontus and John Cassian on strategy for victory over temptation. And today we will be covering an introduction to these two figures and to some sort of rules of, uh, of this strategy, some parameters. And so there'll be just a few slides, uh, mostly conversation, and I'll be going sort of point by point through the material that I sent to you this week. And so we start with uh, an ancient figure in the church, Evagrius of Pontus. And though I've uh, read all of his uh, biographical information a million times, and it's been if you've ever uh, picked up a book about Evagrius of Pontus, you'll know that the same story is told over and over and over because there's basically only one or two sources of information about his early life. And one is in a history written by Palladius of the early church. And the story of Evagrius of Pontus is pretty interesting if you're, if you're into the fourth century. First of all, we should recognize that Pontus is simply a, a region. It's an area that of, uh, of what would, you know, in modern day be called Turkey. So Evagrius of Pontus just basically means that's where he's from. He is most famous, though, for being uh, in Egypt. So we'll get to that in just a moment. But in his early life, he was recognized as a pretty bright fellow. And his father was a bishop. Before long, he was ordained to be a lector in the church. That was back at the time when you could be ordained to be a lector, which is interesting, just to read. Um, and so he was ordained by one of the Cappadocian fathers, by St. Basil of Caesarea, which is an important uh, piece of information because Evagrius is then brought into this tight circle of important scholars and theologians and uh, church father figures, uh, which we now call the Cappadocians. There are three Cappadocians, St. Basil of Caesarea, 
St. Gregory of Nazianzus, and St. Gregory of Nyssa. Two Gregories, one Basil. Uh, Gregory of Nazianzus would become the uh, patriarch of Constantinople for a time and would preside for the first portion of the, over the second ecumenical council. So these are, in terms of church figures, as big as you can possibly get. Gregory of Nazianzus is given the title Gregory the Theologian. Gregory was not given the title Gregory the Administrator because he was famously terrible at administration. And halfway through the Second Economic Council, they said, you're terrible at this, you're out. He, he wrote one of my favorite uh, paragraphs about church meetings. He, after the Second Ecumenical Council, he said, I hate these meetings. <laughs> it's just, and that's like the greatest meeting of all time, the Ecumenical Council. He says, I hate these things. Anyway, so Evagoras of Pontus is connected with the Cappadocians, uh, and he is reportedly an assistant to Gregory of Nazianzus, Gregory the Theologian, at the Second Ecumenical Council. But Evagrius, in city life and amongst, uh, you know, rubbing elbows and hobnobbing with the highest in society at the middle of the fourth century, uh, becomes infatuated with a married woman. And she is married to a Roman official. And this is not a good situation because I believe the story is she was infatuated with him too. And sensing that this was not going well, in fact, even uh, having a dream about uh, soldiers arriving at his door and arresting him and taking him off, he thought, I think it's my time to get out of this place. <laughs> so he got out of that place and he went to Jerusalem after uh, his temptation and a potential scandal. He went to Jerusalem and uh, there was a, uh, something of a monastery and a convent there. Uh, very famously, he was uh, in, in, in close interaction with, uh, you know, we have all kinds of church fathers, a church mother named Melania. Uh, Melania the Elder, you can guess there's a Melania the Younger who comes after her, but Melania the Elder sort of takes Evagrius in and is famous for trying to heal him uh, from what develops in his life is a real sickness. Discovering that no doctor and no medicine could heal this sickness, she discerned that this was actually a spiritual sickness, that this man was afflicted uh, and not by a cold or something like that. Uh, one of my favorite uh, determinations that she made about his sickness was that he, she noticed that he was constantly fussing with his vestments. Is my cassock right? Is my hat right? Is my... Uh, and she noted that as a sickness, and she said, you've got, to, you've got to get out of this place. You've got to pursue solitude. And at that time, uh, the mid to early 4th century Egypt was where monasticism was the most firmly established, the most structured, the best place to be, to be a monk, was in the desert of Egypt. And if you're sick and fussy about your vestments, you can just go to the the desert and be alone, where no one cares about your vestments. <laughs> and you can, look as, you can look as good as you want to, and nobody cares. That's the perfect solution. So we see here uh, uh, one of the few icons of Evagrius. You notice he's not Saint Evagrius. We'll get to that in a moment. But um, Evagrius, anyway, is in solitude in Egypt. Second figure we're going to discuss or, or consider is a fellow named John Cassian. Um, John Cassian is also not Saint John Cassian in the West. In the East, they have a different, uh, a different interpretation. One thing that's uh, compelling about these two figures is that the one is from the East and the other is from the West. And when the one writes, he writes in Greek, and when the other writes, he writes in Latin. So here we are, long before there was ever a divide in the church, when the Eastern and Western church were together, that the same ideas are being stewed about. Um, so John Cassian, you see his dates are about 20 years later, or 10, 10 years later, he, he lives a little bit longer. Uh, John Cassian, in his youth, uh, has a friend named Germanus, and as youth are wont to do, he wandered looking for answers about what this life is all about. 
hearing that the desert was the place where all the wisdom was, he went to the desert and encountered uh, these monks who were pursuing a life of holiness there. And so, um, after his great wisdom that he had essentially received from those desert fathers, uh, he later on in life receives a commission from uh, the history would say Pope Castor. Of course, every uh, major bishop of an area was a pope back then, so uh, now they would say Bishop Castor. But anyway, Pope Castor, I'm going to say, Pope Castor commissioned him as the monasteries in France were trying to get their act together. They needed to hear about how they were doing this in Egypt because they had their act together in Egypt and the monasteries in France were all over the place. And so he said, Cassian, I need you to write to me and for the rest of us, what is it that you discovered when you were in Egypt so that we can get our act together here? He was commissioned to write. And so the first thing he wrote is called the Institutes. And it's about that thick. Okay, the Institutes is essentially what uh, was going on in Egyptian monasticism in the 4th century. And this is uh, much of what we're going to cover today, the second half. The first half is what did they wear? How did they eat? What was their day like? And this is what the order that they were trying to get together uh, in, the, in the monastic movement in the 5th century. He wrote the Institutes. But having received a lot more wisdom than just how was their day and what did they wear, he also wrote the conferences, which is about five of these. So it's about that big. I've got that in my office. I don't know why I didn't bring it. But the conferences, there are 24 of them. And it's simply a dialogue that he and Germanus had a conference with several of the desert fathers. And they're all on different subjects. And they're not, you know, linear. It's not like one building upon the other. It's just a story. Uh, Cassian and Germanus came to Abba Moses and they wanted to know about fasting. And so you find about 10 pages of dialogue back and forth about fasting. And then that one's over, and the next one's about prayer. And then that one's over, and then the next one is about temptation, or something to that effect. The conferences uh, wind up being uh, much longer and a much more thorough account of, of his experience in the desert. St. Benedict of Nursia, who is most famous for establishing monasticism in the West, required or recommended very few things to read in the monasteries, the Benedictine monasteries, which were the first real Western uh, uh, monasteries. And he recommended that they read St. Basil of Caesarea. He recommended that they read Life of Antony by Athanasius. He recommended that they read the Bible and he recommended that they read the Institutes and the Conferences, because we're monks, dang it, and we're going to do this right. Benedictine monasticism reigns in the West for the next thousand years, and that whole time they're reading John Cassian, John Cassian. How do we be monks? How, do we, how should we pray? How should we act? How should we fast? How should we do any of this? So the, the work that John Cassian does becomes extremely influential in the Western Church. And later scholars discover and, and point out that John Cassian, especially in the Institutes, is simply interpreting Evagrius. And so really what is populated through the Western world is the desert wisdom of Evagrius. Now Evagrius gets in trouble later in his the well, actually he doesn't get in trouble. After he dies, he gets in trouble. That's the best way to get in trouble. <laughs> After you die, then get in trouble. But anyhow, uh, he was a follower of Origen, and Origen gets in trouble for some of the theological ideas that he has. And so uh, Evagrius is wrapped up in that. That's why he's not Saint Evagrius in the West. And in some sense, why John Cassian in the West isn't Saint John Cassian. By the way, in the East, here is a Latin father that the East calls Saint John Cassian. One of those points where the East and West have a kind of a disagreement. But nevertheless, uh, what we're going to, to talk about is not all of the conferences and, and all that, but what he puts into the second half of the Institutes, uh, John Cassian does, and what derives from an idea from, John, or from Evagrius, 
called the Eight Thoughts. This later is uh, famously translated or, or transposed by Gregory the Great into the very famous Seven Deadly Sins. But you can see, actually, you can hear the difference between a sin and a thought, right? So the seven deadly sins are those that have already been committed, okay? You've committed it, and now it's a deadly sin. The eight thoughts are what happens before, okay? And then the basic notion is before you ever had a sin, you had a thought about that sin. And there was a moment that the sin was suggested to you, and then it was considered and thought to be delectable, and then it was committed. What Evagrius is getting at is the original suggestion and delectation of the, what put, could potentially become a sin, but uh, really at that point it was just a thought. He said the real battle is the thought. So for instance, if the sin is going to be uh, fornication, there are no women in the desert in Egypt. There's none. So you could say, well, got that one checked off. And Vega says, not so fast. You thought about it all day long. That's the sin. You delected upon it. You savored that idea. And actually, what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, it's basically the same thing. So why don't we take the battle to where the battle begins, which is in the thoughts, and hence the eight thoughts, rather than the seven deadly Sins. Both are fine, no problems, just, just telling you. This is my historical snottiness that older's better. It just continues with me. But the eight thoughts, um, and you'll see there's eight here in a second, they really have, according to Evagoras, three sort of kingpins. Okay, if this was a, if this was a, a battle, as Evagoras describes it to be, uh, he says, no one falls to the other thoughts who wasn't first hit, wounded, by greed, I'm sorry, yeah, avarice, gluttony, you know what, I wrote the wrong word there. That word greed is supposed to be gluttony, I'm sorry, I'm not, what sin that, I'm not sure which sin that was, but I was supposed to, that was supposed to say gluttony. Gluttony first. Secondly, avarice or greed. And finally, vainglory. Those are the three big ones. So let's go backwards. First of all, that's supposed to be gluttony. Let's say it's a G word. So gluttony, um, a sensual sin. You'll hear more about it in the homily for today. But once a person has acquiesced to the sensual sin of gluttony, which will be our next session, they much more readily are, uh, let's say, available or, or vulnerable to sins of porneia. Of course, we translate that in English to fornication, and it takes a much more specific meaning. But porneia is a much broader uh, meaning, and the original word uh, from which we get the word pornography, of course. But it's essentially uh, lust uh, f and, and uh, fleshness, I should say. But anyway, he, he, he attaches those two together. You won't fall to porneia until you fall into greed. So why don't we hit greed first? And why don't we hit not the act of greed, but the thought of greed? <sighs> Keep doing it. Gluttony. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, that's terrible. So I need an editor. <laughs> that's what I need. Anyhow, that's, so the first one is gluttony. That will be our second session. Uh, the second of the main thoughts is avarice, or greed, thank you. That will be the third of our sessions. Avarice simply is the desire to have. So you can say that greed has to do with money, and in some sense it does, but there you are in the desert. Who cares if you have any money, right? So Evagoras points out, that the avarice that's expressed by the monks in the monastery uh, is more like, I have two cassocks, that's not enough. I need three. And once you have three, well, you really ought to have four. I have one cell that I live in, but what if I have a guest? 
I'll probably need two. Let's have two. And once you have two, well, now that I have guests, they have friends, I should probably have three. Before long, you have four cells, 12 cassocks, all kinds of food, and, and no guests, just potential guests. And this, uh, this idea eventually, he, the Cassian draws it out very interestingly, eventually this one that begins with the initial uh, affliction of how can I turn one coin into two, eventually abandons monasticism and the spiritual life altogether because they don't take care of monks here. I've got to go somewhere else. I've got to get out of this place. That's where it winds up. But avarice has three children. Wrath. Anger. Who is angry but the person who feels entitled to something that they didn't get? And you can apply that to much more than money. You can apply that to appreciation or adoration or um, health or, or a whole bunch of things. Once a person has worked through a, a, a hearty fit of anger and nothing has changed, sadness. Sadness is the next offspring. And once sadness has been absolutely acquiesced to, a person turns to despair. And there are several words for it. Listlessness, um, despondency, can't be motivated to do anything, can't be interested in anything. What's the point? Um, that acedia, this, this is a basic structure. It's possible to be stricken with listlessness without uh, these other, but there's a general format and there's method to the madness. It's worth examining this structure. So avarice is what we will uh, speak about, not the next time, but the time after. And finally, vainglory. And you know, uh, vainglory, you'll hear about that some in the homily today, but vainglory is a simple, uh, by, the, by the word itself, you can determine it's a fake glory a not glory. If you are created for glory and destined for glory and you have that sense about you and there's something woven in you that knows I'm meant to be a child of God. I'm meant to be in His presence. I'm meant to be in His courts. I'm meant to be... And what I look around me as I see I'm driving a 1984 Hyundai, that is not sufficient, you know? My cassock is old, dang it. I need a better one. I need, uh, in fact, I need people to recognize me for being someone who breathes a different atmosphere from the common man. And vainglory uh, is, is essentially the mother or the wedge in the door to a kind of pride that is, as I'll mention today, easily recognizable by others and a source of blindness to yourself. And if you've ever met or spent time with a truly narcissistic person, you will know the impossibility of that blindness. Nothing can be said to help them. Nothing, all efforts to pursue them as friends are received as inf further inflation. Uh, all efforts to leave them to themselves are a source of uh, indignation. There's, it's impossible. Really, an act of God has to happen uh, to, to really confront that final stage of pride. Now, I know there's another way of looking at this that says pride is the source of all things. Pride is at the root of all things. But we're looking at strategy here. And if you've been to Costa Rica, you'll know what this picture is. This is a picture of cutter ants, okay? Cutter ants, they have these wonderful little pincers, I'm going to say, I think I got that right, where they chop up the leaves and then they carry the leaves back and then they're the nourishment for the, uh, for the what do you call it, the colony, right? If you were to try to eliminate ants and you tried one by one as they came by in a row to smash them one by one, got them, got them, got them, how long would it take you to, to, to eliminate that infestation of ants? Probably your whole life, and it would, never, it would never happen. Someone's a better pest control person than me. But you've got to get to the queen, to the actual one who's producing ants every five seconds, 
That's the one you've got to get to, and this is the strategy. Instead of mashing these at every uh, explosion here and there, you know, oh, there's another one of my pride things. Oh, gosh, I'm sad again, and I, ah, what am I going to do about this acedia? And oh, I exploded in anger. Um, you know, and there's my, there's my lust again. And, you know, instead of trying to, to hit all of the ants, you should recognize a strategy is being used against you. And if a strategy is being used against you, you should learn what that strategy is and develop a strategy in return. That's what this whole class is about during the season of Lent. It's about uh, a fight, okay? If we're in a fight, if you've ever seen uh, a, a, some terrible YouTube video of a person who knows how to fight versus a person who doesn't know how to fight, it's over quick. So how do you fight? Good question. That's what, we'll, that's what we'll be talking about. And it's not a new conversation. This is from the 4th century, and that was picked up from earlier centuries. So how do we fight this fight? It's a strategy. Since we're talking about old fights, here's one. Anybody? That is David. And you can see this monster beneath him, Goliath. One of the great tools that is, uh, we are encouraged to use, uh, beginning with the Vagris, is what I'll call observation. He doesn't use that word, but he uses something like it. And it's essentially um, stop, look, listen, okay? Um, when you are in the moment of temptation, you have considered the thing you're tempted to do delectable and you're about to act, stop. Step outside of yourself and observe. How did I get here, okay? What was the thought that I had that led me to this place where I was about to do that thing? What was the thought I had before that thought that led me to that thought? How did I ever get that thought into my head? And sometimes you'll chase like the line of ants all the way back to the queen. And you'll say, oh, I see where this is coming from. I feel entitled to fill in the blank. I feel entitled to everyone's adoration. I feel entitled to the finest of foods. I feel entitled to a higher state of living than others. I feel entitled to much uh, more money. This is all beneath me. I don't need to be uh, associating with these people. Or, you know, fill in the blank. Uh, before you're about to be that guy or be that lady, ask yourself, how did I get here to the point where I was about to do that thing? This is observation. And uh, he, uh, Evagris has a very cool thought about that, which is in the process of evaluating how you got here, the demon who almost had you will flee because he's starting to have his strategy exposed and the fun is over of teasing and prodding and torturing this Christian who's trying to follow Christ. The fun is over. Ah, we'll get him next time. We'll get him in another time, a point of weakness. So observation is one of our tools. As you're observing, you start to call things by their right names. As you're saying, I deserve a 2024 Lexus SUV and nothing else will suffice. You start to recognize, I've been calling that 2024 Lexus, I've been calling that what I deserve. And actually, it's a vehicle. It has four wheels and an engine. When you press on the pedal, it takes you forward, gets you to the place where you're going to go, which the 1984 Hyundai was kind of doing anyway. <laughs> if it's just a car, call it a car. Stop calling it your, the flowering of your glorious presence on this earth or something like that, or representation of the kind of person you are. Um, call things by their right names. I'm just picking on cars for now. But uh, you can go anywhere with that. Food. Um, Ah, we'll stop. <laughs> You'll get it. You'll get it in time. Start calling things by their right names as part of observation. Uh, Vegas has a brilliant phrase. He says you need to start uh, essentially observing the situation so that you can call your Go Goliath out to your David to be met alone. 
Goliath doesn't come out with all the, the Philistines with him. It's Goliath alone. It's the one actual queen ant has been brought out. And David uh, can start first with the stone, which is recognizing what the actual situation is. First with the stone, then the sword which is the actual strategy to get rid of this thing and to cut the head off of this. That's the part of the children's stories, children's version of David and Goliath that they don't tell you. You turn the page and it says, and he hacked his head off <laughs> <laughs> with his own sword. And so this idea of David being six years old, you know, some of the paintings you have of David, he you know, comes out and puts his soother down and, and you know, takes a slingshot like that. Okay, no. I think that's a little bit more what David probably looked like. And Goliath, they, sometimes they have him 40 feet high. Uh, uh, okay, okay. I think he's just a pretty big guy, one of the giants of Goth, yes, but nevertheless. All right, so um, observation, something we will uh, be considering. And finally for today, considering at the outset, two words, scopos and telos. At the beginning of the conferences, the first conference with Abba Moses, I think, uh, Abba Moses asks uh, Cassian and Germanus, what is your goal and your end? And they say, the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> and they, he says, very good, very good, the kingdom of heaven, that is your end. What is your goal? And they say, I don't know, what are you talking about? He says that there's a difference between the telos, which is the final end, and the scopos, which is what are you going to do today? If the final end is the kingdom of God, much like the final end of a farmer is the harvest time. You can even put a month on it for certain crops, right? October. In October, I will be harvesting all of the, I'm not a farmer, what do you harvest in October? Barley? Uh, what was it? Pumpkins. pumpkins, thank you. The pumpkins will finally come in in October, but you don't in July sit around and hope for pumpkins. You got work to do. You've got your telos, the kingdom of heaven. Fantastic. He says, what is your scopos? What are you going to do today? Wish and hope for the kingdom of heaven. Uh, okay. But you might have something to do today and a goal for today. And he says, your goal for today is purity of heart. That's what you can evaluate in the morning and in the evening of every day. When you get to the end of that day, you say, ooh, if I was to carry, no, if my spouse or my close friend was to characterize my behavior today, would they say it could be called purity of heart? I could call it purity of heart. Would my spouse call it purity of heart? <laughs> nah, maybe not. Uh, would my closest friend who spent the day with me at Target, would they call it purity of heart? I don't know. That's the evaluation, and it's part of the strategy against sin and temptation and part of the journey of the Christian life that we're uh, heading out here on in the season of Lent is to have in mind the telos, get that, and if you have a, a, the wrong telos, well, you can work on that too. My telos is to be the wealthiest person in Greenville. You know, uh, the reason he says well done, you have the correct end, is that he's happy that they actually chose a good telos, which is the kingdom of heaven. Fantastic. Okay, good. You probably wouldn't go to the Egyptian desert to speak to the desert fathers if you didn't have that intention. But what he points out is you've got to have something to do today. If your telos and your scopos are wrong or worthless, well, then we've got some work to do. Let's say that we're all actually hoping for the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. But today, your goal was to make your spouse obey you. I'm looking at my wife now. 
If that was your goal today, your Scopos, you can see that your Scopos has nothing to do with your Telos. It has nothing to do with your final end. Oh, I'm a follower of Christ, but not today. Oh, today's the actual issue. So, today the goal is purity of heart. Scopos, Telos, the goal in the end. And that's all we have for, for today, for our introduction to the eight thoughts. Like I say, for the f- next three sessions, we'll tackle them one at a time, the generals. We'll, ta- we'll tackle gluttony and its offspring, porneia. We'll tackle uh, avarice and its offspring, wrath, sadness, and despair. And we'll tackle, finally, vainglory and its offspring, pride. These articles will be uh, printed up and sent out as a link in the shield. So uh, you'll have some sense of what I'm going to say and perhaps have questions or thoughts ready, but we have a little bit of time for questions or thoughts today. Any uh, ideas about these? Uh, Bob? Just wonder. So if you have a thought, yeah. and then you act on that thought, right. that two sentences are? Right. No, the thought is not the sin. Okay. Remember that Jesus was tempted in all things, but with no sin which means the temptation is the suggestion. Uh, you will, n- I will say, ne- if Jesus didn't get through life without temptation, I don't know how we're going to do it. <laughs> so I don't think you've ever met anyone that wasn't perhaps even constantly tempted. So the temptation should not, that's another trick of the enemy, I think, is to convince you that because you're tempted, you're a miserable puke. No. Jesus was tempted in all things without sin. So if every time you set foot out on the, on the sidewalk, you're tempted to do five or six different things, I think you just, you know, consider yourself welcome to humanity, you know, welcome to the, the real world. That's us. Um, the delectation of the thing, the savoring of the temptation. Now that's something I don't think Jesus ever did. And then the commission of the thing. I, that's something Jesus de- definitely never did. But savoring the temptation is a beginning point, And that's kind of what we're getting at. Uh, the commission of the sin, well, that's obvious. So. But by the time it's obvious, you've already fallen to the, the, the savoring of the sin and acquiesced to the thought. So let's just go back to the queen ant. And uh, that's kind of the point of this. Any other thoughts? Uh, Rick? Oh, well, in in the uh, conferences, each one of the conferences is a conference between Germanus, Cassian, and one of the Desert Fathers, and they go by names of a great variety. So it's not actually Moses, it's just some guy whose name is Moses. And it doesn't say, it basically the story is they're traveling through the desert and they're going to all these uh, church fathers spending a couple of days with them and sitting down and pleading with them to give them the wisdom that they've discerned in the desert. So it's kind of like a harvesting of desert wisdom in the conferences. So Abba Moses, it almost doesn't matter what his name is, actually. So anyhow, any other uh, thoughts or questions before we conclude? This is our Lenten study. And... Seeing, I see an almost hand, but if not, we're going to conclude today and uh, we'll be back next week with the thought of gluttony.